We will stay the course. We will help this young Iraqi democracy succeed. And victory in Iraq will be a major ideological triumph in the struggle of the 21st century. In this battle, we have fought for the cause of liberty. Even after all that's happened, you can still find the administration's version of the war right here at the WhiteHouse.gov website, a kind of repository of alternative reality from the past four years, where white is black. The Iraqi regime continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. Where down is up. The year 2005 will be recorded as a turning point in the history of Iraq, the history of the Middle East, and a history of freedom. Where the end is really the beginning. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. Blame faulty intelligence, wishful thinking, or willful deception. It's the official record of how the United States has systematically sold and sustained an unwise and ultimately disastrous war. Because of you, our nation is more secure. Because of you, the tyrant has fallen and Iraq is free. Hello, I'm Bob McEwen. Welcome to the Fifth Estate. American presidents lie for many reasons. Richard Nixon did it during Watergate to try to save his presidency. Bill Clinton lied about Monica Lewinsky to try to salvage his reputation, maybe his marriage. But when presidents don't tell the truth about war, as has consistently been the case with George W. Bush, the public has every right to ask, are they lying to protect the country or lying to protect themselves? Since the U.S.-led invasion four years ago, here at the Fifth Estate, we've covered Iraq and the war on terror from virtually every angle. The military, the media, intelligence, politics, revealing aspects of the story that you didn't find anywhere else. Now, we'll put all of that together to reveal what was true, what was not, and how those false or misleading words and ideas have left Iraq, and arguably the world, far more dangerous places than they were before. And as we watch that same pattern emerge again, this time in White House statements about Iran, its support of terrorism, and its nuclear threat, it's worth considering how we got to where we are today, the lies that led to war. It all started with what seemed a simple statement. For America, 9-11 was more than a tragedy. It changed the way we look at the world. That soon became conventional wisdom. Of course, it's not that the terrible events of September 11, 2001 didn't change a great deal. Obviously, they did. I can hear you! At least at first, they galvanized the American people in support of their president. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people... And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. But 9-11 also disguised the fact that the seeds of the Iraq war were planted long before the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. I wish I could tell you it was about oil. I wish I could tell you it was about Israel. No, this is about an idea. According to investigative journalist Seymour Hersh, that idea began with a small group of conservative thinkers in Washington who believed that if the U.S. deposed Saddam Hussein, a tidal wave of democracy would roll around the world. I wish I could tell you it was as simple as they were lying, which would be really, that would be great if they were just lying, because that would suggest some other reality that they know about. It was a world view that dated back to 1991 and the first war with Iraq. In the euphoria after the liberation of Kuwait, a Pentagon official named Paul Wolfowitz began working on a plan that he eventually called the Project for a New American Century, a 21st century dominated by the United States. The U.S. would use its unprecedented economic and military power to impose democratic values and protect American interests, if necessary, by preemptive force. 
According to this letter to then-President Bill Clinton, the trigger would be the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Go in there, lay it down. It rolls over. Iraq rolls over. Saddam is ousted. Um, you get rid of the top leadership, you get a moderate Ba'athist regime, and a democracy flows out of, uh, um, uh, uh, like water out of a fountain. The project for a new American century insisted Iraq would be like Paris after the Second World War. American troops greeted as liberators. Just go in, it's gonna roll over. They believe this. They believe this. Utopian, idealist, a crazy. That manifesto was signed by a pantheon of conservative thinkers, many now familiar names. They couldn't convince Bill Clinton. Governor, are you ready to take the oath? But three years later, that would change. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. George W. Bush appointed to his new administration at least 10 of the hawks in the project for a new American century. Among them, Vice President Dick Cheney, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld's deputy, Paul Wolfowitz, Pentagon advisors Richard Pearl, and former CIA director James Woolsey. Now they were locked and loaded. All they needed was a reason to pull the trigger, a crisis, as they put it in this document late in the year 2000, on the scale of Pearl Harbor. Oh my God, there it goes! Al-Qaeda just happened to take care of that. James Woolsey. This country changed September 11th, just the way it changed uh, December 7th of 1941. We are going to destroy our enemies. Indeed, in his first State of the Union address after 9-11, George Bush endorsed that new world order. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. The next day, the Hawks voiced their approval. This pronouncement from the Project for a New American Century, that at last, the United States understands its role in the world. So 9-11 didn't really change everything at all. It simply provided what those in the Bush administration had been waiting for, an excuse to put their manifesto into action. And after the carnage at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the invasion of Afghanistan, Headquarters of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda was an easy war to sell, both at home and abroad. But the White House had a much greater challenge. How to find a way to connect the September 11th attacks to Iraq so they could take aim at the target they wanted most, Saddam Hussein. Any nation that continues to harbor or support terrorism will be regarded by the United States as a hostile regime. After the worst attacks ever on U.S. soil, George W. Bush set out not only to get even with Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, but also to get Saddam. It would require a certain disregard for the truth. Do you believe that Saddam Hussein had connections to Al-Qaeda? There's no evidence that he had any connections at all. For 21 years, Robert Baer was a top CIA agent, mostly in the Middle East. After 9-11, he watched as the U.S. began to shift blame to Iraq. There wasn't an Iraqi involved in September 11th. There's no evidence there was any connection at all. And this is, you know, months after the war, months after we've gone through the documentation of Iraqi intelligence. And yet we go to war with Iraq. It's just, it, it, the mind boggles. For me, it does. According to Baer, the U.S. was more than willing to ignore the true source of the terror on September 11th and in the previous several years. A bomb in Saudi Arabia kills five U.S. soldiers. Nineteen American soldiers die in another Saudi bombing at a U.S. military barracks. More than 200 perish when truck bombs devastate two U.S. embassies in Africa. A suicide explosion tears apart the USS Cole. 17 American sailors are killed. Though Osama bin Laden, from one of Saudi Arabia's most powerful families, was obviously responsible for most of those hundreds of deaths, U.S. intelligence effectively ignored the place that was his recruitment hotbed. Even though there had been the bombings in 95, 96, 98, and 2000, all involving Saudis, no one asked for a national intelligence estimate if Saudi Arabia is the new 
uh, a new, new Terra state. The Bush administration knew that 15 of the 19 September 11th hijackers came from Saudi Arabia and that bin Laden and al-Qaeda had received Saudi money and logistical support. In other words, that a single country had supplied the manpower, the money, and the mastermind for 9-11. But the Saudis, old friends of the U.S. and the Bushes, got a free pass. When George W. Bush says, terrorists, those who harbor them, those who give support to them, are our enemies. That's obviously not true because Everybody that financed September 11th is currently in Saudi Arabia and free. I mean, it would be sort of like if bin Laden had said, well, you know, it's just a coincidence my guys happened to run into your towers. Are we just going to leave him alone? Last year, Robert Baer's memoirs became a major motion picture, Syriana, about U.S. intervention in Arab politics and oil. George Clooney won an Oscar for playing him. Bear says the U.S. campaign against Iraq was like a Hollywood trailer for a war. Look, Iraq, you know, if you could just go by the weapons of mass destruction, is, is a nice package if you're trying to sell a war, scare people. You know, cash in on the fear of 9-11. And as you will see when we come back, that took a little rewriting of history. This is a regime that has already used poison gas to murder thousands of its own citizens. In the days after September 11, 2001, the White House took dead aim at Saddam Hussein. It apparently made little difference that Iraq had no ties to Osama bin Laden or the 9-11 hijackers. What George W. Bush needed was a slogan, something to sell the idea that Saddam was a global threat. He had to go 15 years into the past to find it. This is a regime that has already used poison gas to murder thousands of its own citizens leaving the bodies of mothers huddled over their dead children. He gassed his own people, became a mantra for President Bush as he pressed the case for war against Iraq. But though that accusation was based in historical fact, as you will see, it didn't begin to tell the whole truth, ignoring two key questions about Iraq's use of chemical weapons. What did the United States know? And what did the U.S. do about it? For those answers, you've got to go back as well, to long before George Bush called Saddam Hussein another Hitler, to the 1980s, when U.S. President Ronald Reagan wanted to call Saddam his friend. Looking back from 2003, it's really hard to understand uh, what it was that American policymakers found attractive about Saddam Hussein. Former U.S. Ambassador Peter Galbraith. At that time, uh, the Reagan administration was indifferent to human rights, uh, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, and it, it saw Saddam Hussein as a strong man with whom it could work. In the 80s, America's arch enemy in the region wasn't Iraq, but its neighbor Iran, which had held American diplomats hostage. When the Iraqis went to war with Iran, the U.S. had found an ally. The envoy sent to seal the deal was none other than Donald Rumsfeld, who years later would label Saddam the single greatest threat to the world. But at this meeting in Baghdad, there was no such animus. Rumsfeld brought a wish list. The Americans wanted oil and to help Iraq defeat Iran. Saddam wanted money and military supplies. It was a perfect match except for one thing. As a top-secret briefing memo shows, the United States was already well aware that Iraq was using poison gas in its war against Iran. But there's no indication Donald Rumsfeld ever mentioned it to Saddam. What's more, the U.S. knew the origin of many of Iraq's chemical weapons was the U.S. itself. The Iraqis were looking to use the United States as they were using Western Europe to acquire equipment, technology for their military forces and if we were dumb enough to sell it to them they were happy enough to take it. Dr. Stephen Bryan was a Pentagon official responsible for keeping American military equipment from falling into the wrong hands. He says Saddam had a booster club in the Reagan administration pushing to sell the Iraqis dual-use technology 
which could have both civilian and military purposes, like helicopters. And again, they said these would be used for? Uh, civilian agricultural use, you know, sprayers. And we said, spray what? You know, we don't like that. But despite the Pentagon's objections, more than a hundred American helicopters were sold to Saddam. And though the U.S. knew about his weapons of mass destruction, it was soon giving billions in aid to Iraq, more than almost any other country, leaving Saddam Hussein free to buy even more weapons. So it came as no surprise at the White House when these shocking images began to emerge in 1988 from a town called Halabja. It was proof of what American intelligence had known for years, that Saddam was not only using poison gas against Iran, but also against his own citizens, the Kurds in the north whom he considered his enemies too. In all, it's estimated at least 30,000 Kurds lost their lives to Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons. So, did Saddam Hussein gas his own people, as George W. Bush has repeatedly claimed? He did, in defiance of every international agreement on arms and warfare. Did the United States know about it? Absolutely, for years, apparently without saying anything. The U.S. also knew that its sales to Iraq of dual-use material, like helicopters and chemicals, could well have facilitated Saddam's mass murder campaign. But apart from issuing an official statement that denounced the gassing of the Kurds when it became public knowledge, what did the U.S. do to stop its ally, Saddam? Absolutely nothing. In fact, the next year, American financial aid to Iraq went up. Then, the horror at Halabcha was forgotten for a decade and a half until George W. Bush needed that slogan to sell his invasion. This is a regime that has already used poison gas to murder thousands of its own citizens. Never any mention of the American role in it. Next, the Bush White House set out to raise the stakes in its campaign against Saddam Hussein with its next lie, the nuclear option. We know that Saddam Hussein had the intent to arm his regime with weapons, weapons of mass destruction. It was Vice President Dick Cheney's job to do it. We do know with absolute certainty that he is using his procurement system to acquire the equipment he needs in order to enrich uranium to build a nuclear weapon. Investigative reporter Seymour Hersh says casting Saddam as a nuclear threat was crucial to convince Americans to support the war. With that case, they could not only, they could not only win the public, but they could win the Senate, the Democrats in the Senate. You, you, know, you have to understand, without that case, I don't think they could have gotten the authority. So when the Central Intelligence Agency couldn't confirm the existence of an Iraqi nuclear program, Cheney began to visit CIA headquarters demanding more forward-leaning intelligence on Iraq. The analysts get the drift. They get the drift. They write reports critical, they go nowhere, they write a report that supports the White House, all of a sudden they're giving briefings at the White House, come on. Everybody gets the drift. Dick Cheney's intelligence network soon included a secretive group at the Pentagon, which worked closely with the Vice President. It was known as the OSP, the Office of Special Plans. Their starting point was not let's try to figure out what was going on but let's see what kind of information we can come up with to justify the policy line that we wish to pursue greg thielman was an intelligence specialist with the u.s state department who watched the emergence of the osp it soon became clear to him what its mission was and who was behind it cheney was was the driving force behind an orchestrated presentation to the american public of a different version of reality than, than at least the reality that we saw. In the intelligence business, that's called cherry picking, selecting individual morsels of information that support a specific point of view, and stovepiping, sending them without analysis right to the White House to be inserted into the president's script. Facing clear evidence of peril, we cannot wait for the final proof. I heard those speeches and read the transcripts, I recognized many of the anecdotes, many of the examples from things we were being given. 